There's a common problem when you come to meditate, especially at night. It's been a long day. You've been working hard. You want some rest. And so you find a calm way of breathing. Try to put the mind in a calm state. But that thought of resting foremost in your mind. And you end up putting yourself to sleep. Which is not meditation at all. Meditation means developing. I mean, you're not trying to develop sloth and torpor. You're trying to develop alertness, ardency, mindfulness. And so it's good to remember the Buddha's analogy of lighting a fire. As long as the fire is still weak, you don't pour ashes on it, you don't pour water on it. You give it more fuel. You fan the flames. In other words, you put more energy into it. And if you do it correctly, you get more energy out. He gives this analogy when he's talking about the factors for awakening. And the energizing factors are analysis of qualities, persistence, and rapture. Those are the things you have to emphasize at the beginning of the meditation, especially when you're tired. Holding in mind that perception that, yes, you do have to put some energy in if you're going to get some energy out. But you have to do it the right way, otherwise you tie yourself. So the energy there is going to be in the rapture. That's the resulting energy that you want. And remember that rapture is a quality that you experience both in body and in mind. How do you fashion the body? Through the way you breathe. This is why John Lee recommends that at the beginning of the meditation you take three or seven good long, deep in and out breaths. And only then think of calming the breath down. And even then you may not want to calm it down quite yet. I know some people complain about this part of his method. I remember when I first read about the Buddhist teaching on breath meditation. I was told that in yoga you manipulate the breath, but in the Buddhist practice you don't change the breath at all. And to this day there are people who make this apart as an issue, saying that a John Lee's method is non-Buddhist, it's a yoga method or a brahmanical method because he manipulates the breath. But there's nowhere the Buddha says not to manipulate the breath. In fact, he says, part of his breath meditation instructions, breathe in and out, sensitive to rapture, experiencing rapture. He doesn't mean simply sitting there waiting until the rapture somehow comes on its own. You've got to induce it. And you can do that by the way you breathe. How else can you do it? The breath is the only physical function that you can manipulate so easily. So you try long in and short out to get more oxygen into your system. And then you look at the way you squeeze your energy as you breathe. There are two places where you tend to squeeze it. One primarily on the out-breath. You fill the body with the breath and then you squeeze it out. Is there some way you can breathe out without squeezing? The squeezing is what depletes the energy, prevents that sense of rapture or refreshment from coming. You can tell yourself, you'll do the in-breath, and the body will do the out-breath on its own without your having to help. You just monitor things until you reach a point where it feels like the breath energy is being depleted. Then you breathe in again. The other place where you tend to squeeze it is between the in-breath and the out-breath, or between the out-breath and the in-breath, as a sort of marker. After all, you're trying to remember now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. Where is the line that divines them? You tend to create a line with a little squeeze. Well, you don't have to do that. Again, that prevents the rapture from developing. 
Think of a smooth exchange of energy, energy coming into energy. And you're here just riding it. Oh, when you think of the breath being all around you, you're wearing it. This gets to the other part, the rapture as a part of the mind, the refreshment as a feature of the mind. You remember what fashions the mind? It's going to be your feelings and perceptions. So notice what kind of perceptions you have about the breath. As the Buddha said, you, once there is a sense of rapture or refreshment, you want it to spread to fill the whole body. Think of the bathman kneading the moisture through the ball of bath powder, or the spring filling a lake with its cool waters. You want to think of the whole body as being open and wide, and the breath can flow anywhere in the body. Down the legs, down the arms, in through the eyes, in through the ears. Hold those perceptions in mind. And again, if you notice there's any sense of squeezing anywhere in the body, as you get more and more sensitive with the whole body breathing, the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out. Just breathe right through those little sensations of squeezing. So you've got the breath, breathing the breath. You're wearing the breath. It's all around you. That's simply a question of maintaining it, staying right there. In this case, you're staying with that sense of energy filling the body, which is much different from simply staying with whatever. Because here you're staying with some something that gives you the wherewithal to keep going, to be alert, to be awake. And John Lee has a nice image. He says it's like spreading an electric line throughout the body. We've got electric lines going down through the arms, through the legs, through the torso. And that way you can light up the entire countryside. Of course, there does come the point where that gets a little bit too much. Some people find it actually threatening. In some cases, because they've had experience drowning, and there is that sense of being close to drowning when everything permeates the body in this way. But you're not drowning in water, you're drowning in energy, you're drowning in air. But still, the whole idea of drowning can be threatening. Other people who tend to bottle up their emotions find it threatening to be unbottled like this. So here again, you have to work with the way you breathe and with your perceptions. If long in and short out is giving you more energy, we'll try to think short in and long out to calm things down. If your perceptions are giving rise to a sense of energy flowing everywhere, use your perceptions again. But this time think of things flowing out, excess energy flowing out of the body. And John Fuhrer would often talk about having excess energy flowing out the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet. I've also found that the spaces between the fingers and the spaces between the toes are good exit spots. You can also think of excess energy going out the eyes. But what's important is that if there's any warning in the mind that you're in a place of danger with all this energy, you've got to change that perception. Sit the mind down and speak to it in a very calm voice and say, look, you're fine. It's simply energy flowing, that's all. And if there's any pressure, think of what it is that causes pressure with this liquid flowing against solid. You've got the blood flowing against the walls of its vessels. So again, change the perception. Think of this as being energy. Energy can permeate anything. This lattice of atoms that 
is your body. It's not really even a lattice. It's just a cloud, and between the drops of the cloud there's space. So think of space all around, permeating everything. The energy can flow out, say, the base of your spine. It's another image from a John Fuang. He would get headaches where it felt like the energy was flowing too much up to his head. Well, think of it going down the spine, out the base of the spine, into the ground. And remind yourself that there are many layers of energy in the body. If this layer of rapturous energy seems to be too strong, well, at the same spot where there's strong energy, there's also a gentle energy. Hold that perception in mind, and you'll find it. This teaches you an important lesson about perception. When you allow yourself to perceive things in a certain way, you see that there isn't often a corresponding reality. Now, this is not always the case, otherwise you could make up any reality you wanted to. But reality has many layers, and often there are lots of things we don't see because we don't allow ourselves to imagine them. And if you like the idea of working with your imagination, remind yourself that as a child you had to imagine that the world was round. It really is round, but it doesn't look round. It looks flat. But if you get way up in space, you realize, yes, it is round. If you're trying to fly from Los Angeles, say, to Moscow, you don't fly simply to the east-northeast, you fly way up north come marching down. That wouldn't work if the world were not round. So there are certain things that you have to allow yourself to imagine before you realize the reality is there. And here it is. There are many layers of energy in the body. And what you're doing as you meditate is learning how to tap into what layer you need. When your fire is too weak, you tap into the layers that are going to help get the fire going. If it's going too strong, okay, you tap into layers that will calm it down, the perceptions that calm it down, the water and the ashes that can reduce the flame. And this way you can adjust it so that's just right. You're here, poised, finding that right balance between being still and alert. quiet and active. And in the course of adjusting things in this way, you've learned a lot about the mind. This is how insight and tranquility can be practiced together. You've learned how to use the processes of fabrication. At the same time, you've found the quality of alertness and stillness that give the mind some genuine rest. <laughs>